Okay, so thanks a lot for the invitation here to give this course. And uh, what I will present today is a sort of a PD point of view for a specific a problem of uh, arising in the theory of specially structured populations. Uh, and the, the main model of PDEs that I will use is a so-called cross-diffusion uh, model, which consists in a set of uh, PDEs in which there is diffusion, but let's say a rather complicated kind uh, of diffusion, uh, plus reaction. So in order to introduce uh, this model, I will uh, first describe uh, things which are much more basic. A large part uh, of those things are already known to most of you, but I will really try to go very slowly uh, at this level. So I apologize in advance for all of you who are really already very familiar with the things that I will uh, now present. Let me first say that this was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Thomas Le Poutre, Ayman Moussa, and uh, Ariane Frescazès. Uh, but let's say the, the original part uh, of the talk is rather uh, related to what will be presented tomorrow. And today I will rather really present more standard things about the modeling and the presentation of the model. Okay, so let me start with um, the very first uh, reasonable population model. This is the logistic equation, which was already presented in many talks uh, yesterday. So let me uh, say a few things about the features of, uh, of the modeling here. So this is something which was introduced in the, in the first part of the, of the 19th century. And um, the point is the following. If you, if you look at a population, uh, when the number of individuals is quite low, there is no competition effect. And then what you expect is just an exponential growth or an exponential decay of the population. And this will be done with a rate uh, which is called here uh, R0, which is something which is specific to the population you are, you are looking at. Okay, so this is one of the parameters of the model. And you can see this, this exponential growth uh, at, at this level here when the, the number of individuals is not that high. Then what happens is that uh, after a certain time, the competition effects between the, the, the individuals will appear. And because of this, uh, the growth will not be exponential anymore. And what you expect is this, is this curve here, which is like a S, if you wish, which is a logistic curve. And you can see that it departs uh, strongly from the exponential at a certain level. So here you have in red the exponential and in blue the logistic curve. And the idea of Fairhulst is that basically you have a number here which is, which is represented by the green curve, which is K and which is called the carrying capacity that we saw uh, already many times yesterday. And this is a maximal number of individuals which uh, can live in the, in the place we are looking at because the resources uh, allow only this number uh, of individuals to, to, to survive, okay? So you can see the logistic curve, uh, which you can see here, as a sort of interpolation between the exponential growth, which is here, and this maximal uh, number of, uh, of individuals, uh, which, is, which is here. Uh, so at the level of the, of the ODE, this means that you have a linear term, which is this, uh, uh, responsible for the exponential growth. And then you have this uh, uh, quadratic correction, which is really the, the logistic uh, effect. Uh, of course, it's possible to compute explicitly the, the, the solution of the ODE, and you get this, this logistic function here. Okay? So this is for, for growth. Uh, and uh, if you look at the real data, uh, it's quite interesting to see that the uh, the kind of points that you, that you get is, uh, is rather well modeled by the, by the logistic uh, equations. If you choose, of course, the right parameters, you have two parameters to choose. 
So here the K is obtained very quickly by looking at the, at the last part of the, of the points and just trying to, to get the average of this. And then the, in order to get the exponential, you have to go to, a, to a, a, a logarithmic scale and the interpolation is also quite easy to, to do. So it's, it's really the reason why I think this model has been extremely popular for, for many, many years, that it's really easy to get the parameters out of the points that you can get uh, from data. And I think that this uh, specific uh, um, picture here, which corresponds to the, to the number of sheep in Tasmania after they were introduced at the beginning of the, of the 19th century, um, is rather typical of the, of the, uh, of the way uh, things are fitted by the, by the logistic uh, equation. So as you can see, you have a certain number of points which are rather far away from the curve. So like you have maybe like 20% 20, 20 difference between the points and the curve. And my feeling is that in many situations you have this uh, type of difference between the data and the, and, the, and the theory. So of course this is much more than uh, what you get in many, many situations in physics. Okay? So you, don't, you, you should not uh, be too, um, uh, how to say, too sure about what those numbers are, and also even the model is not that precise, okay? So, as we will see later, if you change, for example, the u over k here by something which is not linear anymore, then you can get a fit which is not much worse than what we see in this slide here, okay? Okay, so this is for growth. Now let me say uh, a few words about the, the, the typical dispersion models you can expect when you don't know that much about the uh, behavior on, of individuals in a population. So typically what you will assume is that you have a random walk for individuals, uh, which is uh, isotropic in some sense. Uh, so of course there are situations where it is not isotropic for many different reasons uh, related to the geography of what you're looking at. But let's say uh, in absence of other uh, 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 I don't know how to say that, but let's say uh, isotropy is a, rather, uh, is a rather reasonable assumption if you don't know anything else on the geography. Okay. Uh, and so, if now you look at a scale of time and space which is quite large, then uh, what you can expect is to see that kind of picture here. So here in red, green and blue, you have three uh, different uh, numerical experiments uh, with a very uh, simple random walk in 2D. And as you can see, when you see it from far away, uh, you observe something which looks like a Brownian motion. Okay? And if you look at the typical distance between points here, you see that it's like maybe uh, 50 or something like that. And uh, if you look then at the number of, um, of time steps in, in the experiment, uh, here it's something like uh, a few thousand. So you typically have about the square root of this number of time step when you look at the typical distance uh, here. So this really uh, is typical of uh, of uh, Brownian motion. Uh, now here you have the, a plot of uh, one or two of those experiments. So the, the, the red one corresponds to a certain number of time steps and the blue one to a number of time steps, which if I remember is uh, maybe the double of the, of the previous one. And uh, so the, what, you, what you see here are really data and as you can see, you can, you can feed them with, the, with curves, which are in red here and in blue here. And um, those data represent, uh, in a given experiment, which is done in 1D this time, uh, the distance to the center of the points which, are, which is following the random walk. Uh, so as you can see, those curves really look like Gaussians. And uh, another thing that you, can, uh, that you can show is that when you look with respect to time, the variance of the, of the Gaussian is proportional to time. So those things are really uh, typical of the, of the Brownian motion. And in fact, it's possible to really uh, show 
rigorously that uh, if you take a very simple random walk, you will converge toward uh, the Brownian motion, which from the point of view of PDEs means that you will have at the end a diffusion equation. So let me present maybe in a few minutes uh, how this can be done in the simplest possi possible case because this is really an elementary computation. So for example, you take uh, a random uh, variable which you call xi and which uh, takes the value delta x or minus delta x with probability one half. Okay? So here delta x is a strictly positive, very small number, let's say. We will let it go to zero in the, in the SQL. And you suppose, that, uh, you suppose that all the xi are independent, and then you look at the sum of the xi, so uh, in terms of random walk, this means that you really look at the position after p time steps of the, of the individual. So it's very easy to compute the law of sp, and uh, what you can show is that if you take a number, an integer number q here, the probability that sp is at point q delta x can be computed thanks to this formula here. So here you have uh, 2 to the minus p, and here you have the binomial coefficient at p and q plus p over 2. And as you can see here, q plus p has to be uh, even in order for this to exist. And in fact, this is uh, quite reasonable because uh, this will be equal to 0 if q is not, has not the same uh, evenness, if it exists. Well, if Q minus P <laughs> is not even, okay? Uh, so then we, then we look at the, we take uh, a certain number uh, T and uh, we select delta T in such a way that T over delta T is an integer number, which is this P here. And we compute uh, this quantity, uh, capital N of P delta T X, as a probability that the individual is between X minus delta X and X plus delta X after P time steps. According to the, to the computation of the law of SP, this means that this quantity is exactly this quantity here, 2 to the minus P C P Q plus P over 2. And, uh, since this thing is really made of uh, 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 factorials, it's really possible to use uh, Stirling's formula and to compute the asymptotic expansion uh, of this thing here uh, when p tends to infinity and q is not too large. So actually, when you do the asymptotic expansion, you can check that the you, you, you need that Q to the three is not uh, growing more than P to the square, and actually it has to go, Q to the three divided by T, P to the square has to go to zero. Then you can show that actually this quantity is just like something which you already recognize here, uh, in which you have the, the Gaussian in terms of Q, and this is divided uh, at, at, by P, so here, P uh, uh, will be a, a variance, uh, and you have this 2 over square root of 2 pi P, which also corresponds to something which uh, you naturally find in the, in the diffusion equation. Okay, so you can just uh, assume that this lemma is true. It's not a very complicated computation, but it needs like maybe 20 minutes to get it, it's, it's not that easy. You have to, to go far away in the expansion to get the first term, in fact. Um, and so if now you, you, instead of writing it in terms of P and Q, which are the number of time steps and the points on the, on the lattice that you have, you write it in terms of uh, time and space, and uh, this corresponds to taking the time step to the uh, to the square less than the uh, space step to the, to the third. Um, what you can show is that n of tx is equal to exactly this quantity here, which is exactly the same as in the previous slide, except that I changed p in x divided by delta, uh, sorry, um, p is changed in t divided by delta t, and q is changed in x divided by delta x. 
So you can recognize here the t divided by delta t, the x divided by delta x, and here also t divided by delta t, and uh, delta x is cancelled by the square root of the delta x square, which is here. So this is really exactly the, uh, what was obtained in the lemma uh, previously. So once you have written it in this way, you see that the, the, the quantity delta t divided by delta x to the square naturally appears in the, in the, in the formula. And so if you, if you let delta t go to zero and delta x uh, go to zero in such a way that this quantity converges to something which is strictly positive, finite and strictly positive, um, you, you see that n of tx divided by 2 delta x, the quantity which is here, converges exactly to u of tx, which is defined as this Gaussian in x here. And it, as you can see, this has been replaced by 1 over 2d. And here, this quantity uh, becomes 1 over square root of 2d, that you find again at this level. OK? So, what has been proven at this level is that n of tx divided by 2 delta x converges to something. Okay? But if you remember what is uh, capital N, capital N is defined as a probability to end up between x minus delta x and x plus delta x. So if you want to have a density, you have to, div to divide by the length of this interval, which is 2 delta x. Okay? So here it's quite natural to divide by 2 delta x, and what this tells you is that the limit uh, that you obtain from the, random, from the random walk in this way is exactly this function here, which is exactly the elementary solution of the heat equation in dimension 1 with a diffusion coefficient d. And uh, this means that u, which is defined by this formula, exactly satisfies the heat equation with a diffusion coefficient d, which is written here. And at time zero, it's just the direct mass uh, at point zero. Okay? So as you can see, this is uh, completely elementary. Those are really elementary computations which can be presented uh, very early, in fact. Uh, and the, let's say the, this is a way of, de of deriving the, the, the heat equation. Uh, from a random walk which is extremely simple. But of course, if you take a random walk which is more complicated but which satisfies the basic requirements that it is isotropic and a few other uh, reasonable requirements, you will end up with exactly the same result. The, uh, the coefficient d may depend on, on what you put exactly inside. So in some sense, this tells you that whatever the random walk is uh, at the level of the individuals, if you look at it in the right scale, and the scale corresponds to this, that this is going to zero and this is going to a certain number, what you will end up with at the end is always a diffusion equation. Okay? So there is some, in some sense, there is some uh, uh, generic character of the, of the diffusion equation. And uh, from the, the specific way the individuals are moving at, at, at their scale, what remains at the end, when you look at a, from very far away and, and on a very large time, is just this coefficient d here, okay? So this was just to explain why uh, the, typical, uh, the typical dispersion model for, for, for populations when you look from far away is given by the, by the heat equation, okay? Now, if you... If you look at the solutions of the, of the heat equation uh, starting from a direct mass, uh, this is what you see when you, when you plot it. So you have here the direct mass. And when time evolves, uh, you can see that you, you have here uh, Gaussians, which are, which are written here, uh, which are more and more uh, uh, whose variance, let's say, is, uh, uh, is uh, larger and larger, and the variance is, in fact, exactly linear with respect to time. So you get this, really, this picture at the end, and it's what you have to think of when you have this dispersion of individuals, that they are, they are concentrated at the beginning, and then they will spread exactly with this shape. Okay. 
So we recover the, the diffusion equation, which was first uh, introduced by Fourier in the, at the beginning of the 19th century again. Now, if you mix uh, the diffusion and the logistic uh, growth, you end up with the model which was uh, described many times yesterday, which is the Fischer, Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, Piskunov. So I actually, I dared write Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, and Piskunov, but I must say that this is the, this is the French translation of, uh, of Cyrillic. So in English, it would not be written in the same way. Uh, so the, the model uh, appeared in, in those two papers uh, um, of, of 37 that were uh, uh, described by, uh, by Chris yesterday. And uh, the, the, the point here is that you mix the, the diffusion equation, which we obtained from the random walk uh, in the previous slides. So you have this part here. And then you have this part which corresponds to the logistic growth which was uh, obtained from the, from the, the model of Fairhulst for ODEs, okay? So you sort of mix what you know for ODEs and what you know from the dispersion and you end up with this uh, Fisher KPP model. Uh, it's, what is quite interesting in this model is that you have a, a very small number of parameters because you have added basically the diffusion uh, uh, coefficient D and the R0 and K from the logistic uh, model. So you end up with something in which there are only three parameters. And uh, what has been uh, 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 very interesting from the beginning with this, with this model is that there are actually solutions uh, which are quite special and uh, uh, which are called traveling waves and which were described uh, yesterday. Those consist in a uh, function of x minus ct in which at the beginning you, 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 you put a c which you choose by yourself and you try to see what equation gets out of this. So if you try to put uh, this and that in the, in the, in the fischer kpp equation here, as you can see, if u is a function of x minus ct, when you take the derivative respect to t, there is minus c, which is going out. And when you take the derivative respect to x two times, you will have um, just uh, the second derivative of the, of the function, which is, which is going out. So this gives you minus c times n prime here, and here, n secant. And so, any solution of the ODE, which is, which is here, will give you a special solution of the PDE, which is in fact called a traveling wave, okay? Because it's a function of x minus ct. So it's really what you expect for a wave. And now the, the point is that if you impose moreover that n at time minus infinity is the carrying capacity that you have in the logistic equation, so this k here that you can find in, in the picture at this level. And if you impose that at time plus infinity, this is zero, which you can also see here uh, in this picture, then you can try to solve this equation, this ODE, with these two uh, uh, Cauchy conditions. So it's not really Cauchy, actually, it's more, uh, it's maybe more uh, Dirichlet at infinity. And in the theory of uh, ODEs, this is called the heteroclinic uh, junction problem. So if you can find a solution of this, okay, um, then you will have uh, you will have solutions of the PDE, uh, which looks like this. So you you take the function which is in blue here, which is a solution of the ODE, and then it will move forward in time uh, according to this to this law here, okay, with the velocity c. So you can see why now this is called the traveling wave. You have this, uh, this profile here, and it will move forward in the, in the evolution. So this, uh, uh, this, very, this is quite easy to, to show, that if you have a solution like this, you have this, uh, this shape, etc. What is not uh, completely obvious is to show that you have indeed uh, uh, only one solution to this, 
And actually, uh, for this, you have to know that uh, C satisfies a certain uh, condition, and this condition is that C is in fact bigger than a critical value, which can be computed out of the parameters by this formula here, which is the square root of 2R0D. So you can see that R0 and D are uh, indeed parameter which naturally appears in the, in the equation. And so uh, if C is bigger than this critical speed, um, you have a solution of this, okay? And then uh, if you want to, if you, if you have in mind that this has to correspond to something that you can really see in nature, um, you have to know that this, uh, this, the solution of this is somehow uh, stable in the, in the PDE setting. And uh, this is more difficult to show, but actually it was shown by, uh, uh, by Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, and Spitkunov in, in this paper, that if C is exactly equal to the critical speed, then actually the wave is stable. Which means exactly the following, that now if you start uh, with uh, uh, um, any reasonable initial datum for the PDE, and you wait long enough, then the solution will really look like this thing going, uh, uh, traveling at velocity C. So this, uh, because of this, this has really been the more, uh, the most popular, yes, please. Might be, so if, I'm, if I made a mistake, <laughs> sorry about, about this. <laughs> uh, so you see at this level why this has been a very popular model uh, for uh, invasion of uh, species uh, since, this, uh, since this period here, because you really have a very small number of parameters in the models, in the model, like three parameters, and it really describes uh, a wave of uh, individuals uh, invading, invading a, dom a domain. Let me show uh, a picture uh, which is uh, taken out from, uh, from a, a small, uh, a small uh, computer uh, program, uh, which is um, this is something which is performed in 2D. So you start with, uh, you start with uh, a population which is uh, concentrated in a small, it's in a small uh, amount of space here, and you look at the way in which it invades the, the domain. So you have here uh, exactly the fischer kpp equation which is solved, but this is now in 2D. So as you can see, you have a first phase in which things are really just growing, and you can see that it's growing up to a certain point here, which is one, in fact, in this picture which is a carrying capacity of the, of the problem. And then once it has reached this, uh, this uh, height, it will uh, sort of thicken, and you can see the wave now, which is going, since it is in 2D, it goes in all, in all directions, and this thing is thickening and thickening, and you can see that this means that somehow, if you now you look from above, what you would see is that you have a sort of patch in which the individuals are living, which is growing and growing, and so this really describes the invasion of the, of the population of a certain space, okay? And uh, what is really uh, quite interesting here is that if now you look at data and you have uh, a situation in which you have an invasion, uh, then you can in some sense recover uh, a certain uh, uh, part of the of the parameters of the Fisher KPP equation, because if you can measure the speed, you get, uh, let's say, R0 times D. And if you can measure the number of species that you have at the level uh, when the invasion is complete, let's say, then you have the carrying capacity K. So you can produce at least two parameters out of the three in, in the equation with, with data, with very simple measurements. And I insist on the fact that those measurements are really macroscopic. So you don't care at all about what the individuals are doing. You just look at the way the patch is growing, and you look at the, uh, the number of individuals that you have in the center of the patch, and this gives you two of the three uh, components that you have in the Fisher-KPP equation. 
So this, is, this explains, from my point of view, why this model is extremely popular and why it is most probably the most uh, used model when you look at uh, biological invasions, because you can really get part of the microscopic parameters out of the macroscopic data. Okay, so this was just to introduce uh, Fisher KPP. And let me also say one word about the uh, about maps that you can find in, uh, in, in some uh, books on uh, epidemiology or in, uh, in uh, let's say, population dynamics. Uh, actually, this one is taken out from the book by Murray, the mathematical biology, which I suppose many of you uh, have used in the past. So this is the, this is the, um, uh, actually, it's, it's, I don't think it's possible really to read what is, what is written here, but, uh, but this is actually the, 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 the plague, the black death in the, in the years, uh, uh, so 1347 uh, to 1350 uh, in Europe, and the lines that you can see here are lines which correspond to the, to the um, part of Europe which was uh, in which the plague was active at a certain time. And so it starts uh, here. And as you can see, it started actually in Marseille. So, well. uh, so, uh, so this is the first line that you can see here. And uh, then you have this one, and then this one. And as you can see, you have uh, successive lines, then, and it goes uh, to the north of Europe. Uh, later, but uh, usually when so that, that kind of pictures uh, is also presented in many books which are not uh, mathematical books, let's say, and nobody really thinks about uh, what that kind of pictures means. And uh, the point is that I, I I I want to insist on the fact that this is really because you think that that kind of invasions or uh, in that case of, of epidemics is related to the Fisher KPP equation in some way that those uh, maps make sense. Because what, what is um, implicitly supposed when you have a map like this is that actually you have a whole region in which the, the plague is present and a whole region in which it is not at a given time. And that this moves with time. But this is something which is an assumption. I mean, it's not, you could, you could imagine situations in which you have a certain amount of uh, plague level at a certain point and another one at another point. And the fact that you have really a situation in which you have like all the population has been touched by the plague and at some other point it has not yet arrived, it's really something which is related to the traveling waves that we saw in the previous slide. So this kind of pictures make sense only within the assumptions of the model, uh, of a model which is of uh, Fisher KPP type, let's say. Actually, here you have another one which corresponds maybe more to the Fisher KPP by, than this, because this one corresponds more to uh, uh, RIS models that you can find in, in, in epidemiology. But in this one, it's really Fisher KPP. And this is the propagation of a pest which actually arrived in Bordeaux, this one, in, the, in 1924, and uh, which propagated then through Europe. So it's not so easy to see the different. Uh, but you have really lines uh, exactly like in this picture here at this level, okay? So I think this is also uh, another reason why the Fisher KPP is, is that popular, is that it makes sense when you look at pictures like this. Okay, so next step in order to understand the modeling by cross-diffusion consists in looking at populations in which now you have more than one species uh, or more than one categories uh, of individuals, let's say. Uh, as you know, uh, in biology, you have very, very large number of species, even if you look just at a given, at a given uh, uh, specific uh, spot in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in, in terms of space. And uh, you have many, many interactions between the different uh, species. So you have like uh, feeding networks and things like that. But let's say that uh, one of the main interactions is really the competition between, between individuals. And in, especially if you look at, indivi at individuals which belong to species which are close to, to one another. And so um, people tried very early to write models to, 
understand this, uh, these computation effects between various individuals. And I would say that probably the, the work of Lotka and Volterra was the first one in which, in, in, in which it was really written in mathematical form, this idea. And uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, Lotka and Volterra at the beginning of the, of, of the uh, 20th century was to uh, consider now two concentrations of uh, two different species. So let's call them U of T and, and V of T. So now uh, in, in, in this specific model, they depend only on time. You do not look at the, uh, at the spatial dependence. And so you write a system of ODEs for this. And the point is that uh, it has to be somehow compatible with the previous model, which was the uh, Fairhulse model for, of logistic growth. Uh, so it has to look like a logistic growth, but now since you have two uh, uh, concentrations instead of one, uh, you, you have two different growth rates when the uh, number of individuals is slow, is, uh, sorry, is um, low, so like uh, U prime equal to R1 U, V prime equal to R2 V. And then if the amount of individuals becomes large enough, uh, you have a whole matrix of competition which is introduced, which would correspond to the one uh, parameter which was a carrying capacity in the case of only one species. Okay, so this is in some sense the most uh, complicated uh, models which respects the uh, compatibility with the logistic equation when you have only one species, okay? So you have uh, the linear part here and the quadratic part here in which you have the whole matrix which is sometimes called the competition matrix. And um, let's say that the, the following interpretation uh, um, is made for, for those terms S, I, J. So S11 and S22 are called the intraspecific competition, and this means that this is the competition which is uh, felt by individuals uh, of species U because of other individuals of species U, and of course the same for V. And those two terms here, uh, which are called sometimes uh, interspecific competition, is a competition which is felt by individuals of species U because of individuals of species V. Okay. Uh, and so you can find uh, many different uh, um, values for those terms. Let's say that in many models you have the terms corresponding to S12 and S21 is, uh, is, a, is a smaller than the terms corresponding to S11 and S22, meaning somehow that competition is strongest between individuals of the same species. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, in, in this model here, uh, the fact that it is competition which is modeled and not something else like predator prey or cooperation means that the S, I, J here are all non-negative. So the fact that you have minus here and the fact that all those terms are non-negative, I repeat, this is really specific of competition. This is really the, the fact that the, you are really modeling competition and not something else, okay? Lotka Volterra models, also include uh, other cases like cooperation, predator prey, etc. So when you look at the system of two ODEs, uh, you can try to find the, to, let's say, to, to, to get the, the face portrait of those two uh, autonomous ODEs. And uh, basically, you can see that depending on the parameters Ri and Sig, there are two main uh, possibilities, and uh, this is uh, an elementary uh, computation, but it's, it's quite long to, to, to do it when you keep all parameters free. Uh, let's say that there, there is this case which is sometimes called strong competition, in which the only stable equilibrium for the system of two ODEs is, uh, is uh, uh, a couple here in which one of the two is equal to zero. This means that uh, what you expect then is that the, you have the two, at the beginning you have a certain number of individuals for the two species, but when you let the time evolve, because of the competition, you will go to a state in which only one of the two species is present. And this is called uh, competitive exclusion. 
And then if the parameters are different, so for, for a certain class of parameters, let's say, you have also the possibility that the competition is weaker in the following sense, that you have only one stable equilibrium for the system of ODEs, but in this equilibrium you have the two species which are present, and this is called coexistence. So you can predict, this is an elementary computation, according to the parameters you can predict if you can, if, if in, in, in the long term you will have the two species which are uh, coexisting or if only one species will, uh, will, uh, will be there at the end. Uh, okay. So let me now come to the, to the introduction of the spatial structure in those uh, competition models. So this, as we did for the logistic uh, equation plus diffusion in order to get the Fisher KPP, um, it's possible here to add diffusion in the uh, lotkar volterra model for, for two species in competition. And what you end up with is this system of reaction diffusion in which now U is uh, uh, the density of individuals which at time t and point x, uh, which are at time t and point x, and V is the same for the second species. So those are two quantities which are non-negative. They live in now in a certain domain, which we call omega, and the equation that they satisfy is the following. You have here the terms which were already appearing in the lotka volterra ODE. But you also have the diffusion terms. Uh, so there is no reason a priori why the diffusion coefficients for the two different species should be equal. So what you expect is that you have a certain coefficient of diffusion for the first one and another one for the second one, so that at the end, the reaction diffusion systems look like this, with the parameters D1, D2, and uh, the six parameters appearing in the competition, which are completely free. Just remember that all the parameters here are non-negative, and also D1 and D2 are non-negative, because of course this is diffusion. Okay. And uh, I think now I will switch uh, on, the, on the blackboard. What I want to, to tell you now, and I will maybe uh, take uh, uh, 20 minutes to present it, is that it has been observed already a long time ago that for this situation in which you have these signs for the, for the diffusion and the, and the competition terms, it's not possible to have Turing instability uh, for this model, which means that if you take uh, a steady state for the ODE, an equilibrium, uh, which is stable, so it can be, if you are in the most interesting case in which you have coexistence, this is a state in which you have both species which are present. Uh, so if it is stable for the, the ODE, it will also be stable for the PDE, which means that you cannot get patterns out of this, special patterns. And uh, uh, no, in, in particular, no segregation of species appears. So I will comment on this uh, a lot. Let me just say at this level that what this means is that though the individuals are in competition, there is no way if they just diffuse like this, there is no way that they can avoid uh, uh, each other. So even if the competition if the uh, interspecific competition is the strongest and they, in principle, it would be better for the individuals uh, not to be in contact with the individuals of the other species, there is no way if you start from this simple model that they will end up in different positions in, in, in space. And then the mo next model will be really addressing exactly this, uh, this issue. But before uh, doing this, I will uh, now explain uh, in maybe, let's say, 20 minutes, I hope, what is really Turing instability. So I, once again, I apologize for all of you who already are familiar with Turing instability. 
But since this is really the reason why the next model was introduced, I think it's really important for me to really explain uh, what this means. So I will do this on the blackboard. And so maybe... We'll do it like this. Okay, so if I write at this level, everybody can see? It's okay? Okay. Perfect. So, uh, so let me describe what is Turing instability, and I will start with a version which is a purely uh, linear algebra version of uh, Turing instability. So one way of describing it is the following. There exist two matrices in dimension two, so those are two by two matrices, which I will call A and B, with real coefficients. So they belong to M2 of R, if you, are, if you like algebra. Uh, and uh, such that the following holds. So first thing is that A is uh, diagonal. with negative coefficients. So this means that you can write A as minus D1, D2, like this, 0, 0, with the DI strictly positive, OK? The second thing is that uh, B um, has two eigenvalues with negative real parts. So this means the following. You have B equal to A, B, C, D like this, and uh, to say that B has uh, uh, eigenvalues with, uh, uh, with negative real parts can be seen on the trace and the determinant of B. So the trace uh, has to be uh, negative. So you have A plus D, which is, let's say, strictly negative. And the determinant has to be positive because it's the product of the two, uh, the two eigenvalues. So you have AD minus BC, which is strictly positive. OK, and the, the, the last thing is that now if you look at A plus B, then A plus B has one positive eigenvalue. at least. But in fact, as we will see, there is one positive and one negative, or one, posit one with positive real part and one with negative real part. Uh, so as you can see, this is rather surprising in the sense that you, you take um, a matrix which has two negative eigenvalues, you add things which are really very negative in the sense that it's diagonal plus each coefficient are negative, and yet, at the end, you get something which has one positive eigenvalue. So, uh, let me uh, show to you how this can happen. I, I, I put proof, but actually, it's, it's a very big word for a very small computation. So, <laughs> so uh, first thing is that if you look at uh, A plus B, 
you get minus d1 plus a, b, c minus d2 plus d, like this. And uh, if you take the trace, you see that this is uh, a plus d minus d1 minus d2. And since we know that a plus d is uh, strictly negative, and d1 and d2 are uh, strictly positive, uh, this is clearly uh, also strictly negative. In fact, the trace has been, in some sense, uh, uh, is even more negative than the trace of the original matrix B, okay? And now if you look at the determinant, Uh, you see that you have the original determinant of B, which is AD minus BC, okay, uh, plus D1, D2, and then you have minus D1, D minus D2, A. Okay. So this is the original uh, remark of uh, Turing that no 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 bon. <laughs> uh, that uh, though this term is uh, positive by hypothesis okay this is the hypothesis two. And this term is also uh, positive because uh, this is d1 times d2. Uh, actually, those two terms have no clear sign because what you know is just that a plus d is strictly uh, negative, but there is uh, no hint about whether both a and d are negative. Okay, so now if you select if one selects uh, A uh, positive and D negative, okay, uh, then you see that uh, if you take D2 very small, then uh, this term and this term will be negligible with respect to the two terms which are here. And now if you take D1 very large, then this term will be positive because D is negative. It will be positive and in fact it will be if D1 is really very large, it will be bigger than this one. Uh, yeah, sorry, I made it in the wrong way. Uh, so it's the, it's the opposite, okay? You want to have to... So it has to be this way, sorry. Let me begin again. <laughs> so you take uh, D positive and A uh, negative. You take D1 very small, T2 very small in such a way that those two terms are negligible respect to the two other ones. Then you take D1 very large, so that uh, actually minus D1 uh, uh, D is, uh, is negative, and in fact can be as negative as you wish if you take D1 very large. And so it can be less than uh, minus AD minus BC which is a negative term because AD minus BC is positive, okay? And so in that case, you see that the debt of A plus B is negative. So if you end up with the debt of A plus B negative and the trice, which is also negative, this means that you have one of the eigenvalue which is positive, okay? 
And so this is, uh, as you can see, this is an extremely simple computation, which is due to Turing, in fact, and which tells you that you can, in some way, you can produce a matrix which, is, uh, which has a positive eigenvalue out of matrices which are a, a sort of, uh, which are very negative in the sense that they have, both of them have uh, negative eigenvalues, and moreover, one of them is diagonal, okay? Let me just say one word about what this uh, implies, because this is the, the world computation is based on the fact that you can take an example in which one of the coefficients, one of the diagonal coefficients in B is negative. Um, as you can see, uh, this is not a problem for getting A plus D uh, less than zero, okay? It's enough to have a D which is sufficiently uh, uh, sorry, this is it's this one which should be explained. Sorry, not this one. So you can take D uh, positive and uh, A negative because this is not a problem for A plus D less than zero. It just depends on the relative modulus of A and D. But you have also to be careful that then AD minus BC has to be positive in order to produce the example, okay? Now, if AD is negative, okay, because of this, you see that uh, uh, minus BC has to be very positive, it has to be positive at least, and so uh, BC has to be negative, and so either B or C has to be negative. So, all of this to tell you that in order to produce Turing instability, you need to have a matrix B which, is, uh, which has the following sign structure. So, Turing instability can occur only when B has the following sign structure. Uh, actually, one of the following sign structures, I should say, which is like this. So you have to have something which is either like this, or like this, or so the last one is like this. Okay? So you have to have two coefficients which are positive and two which are negative, and they have to be both on the same row or on the same column, okay? Uh, okay, so this is the statement for linear algebra. So what has, what has this to do with the reaction diffusion PDE now? Uh, so this requires uh, uh, a process of linearization of the PDE. So let me uh, recall the following on already on the on the ODE. So let me start with the link with ODEs. So now if you look if one looks at uh, a system of two autonomous ODEs that is U prime equal of f of u and v, and v prime is equal to j of u and d. If you take an equilibrium, that is u0, v0, such that this is equal to zero and this is equal to zero, let's consider an equilibrium 
u0 v0, that is That is, uh, you suppose that f and g are equal to zero at point u0 and v0. Then the theory of ODEs tells you that uh, this equilibrium is stable when uh, the matrix uh, obtained by linearization around those points has uh, strictly uh, negative eigenvalues or eigenvalues with strictly negative real parts. So the matrix is what I will now call B. So this is uh, DF over DU at point u0 v0, df over dv at point u0 v0, dj over du, and dj over dv. Uh, so has negative, strictly negative, to be clear, negative, uh, or let's say eigenvalues, two eigenvalues with strictly negative real parts. Uh, so you can see at this level the link between uh, the stability of the equilibrium for the ODEs and the assumption two. Okay, the fact that B has uh, eigenvalues with negative real parts. Okay, now I add uh, the diffusion and uh, uh, so we'll call this link with the PDE. So rather than giving you a general statement, let me focus on one example. So, uh, the example is when the, uh, the domain on which you look at the PDE is just uh, an interval, which will be in, in that case 0p in order to have uh, simple uh, uh, computations in the, in the Fourier setting. And, uh, you add Neumann boundary condition. So, let me write down what this means exactly. So now, instead of, of, instead of looking at this uh, system of ODEs, you look at the system of PDEs. So now U is U of Tx, V is V of Tx, and you add diffusion terms. So we are in, in 1D, so it, it's right just like this. So this is the diffusion part of the system of PDEs. And this is now the reaction part. OK. And the point is the following. Now you still look at uh, an equilibrium U0, V0, where U0, V0 do not depend on x. So you take something which is an equilibrium of the ODEs and which will necessarily be also an equilibrium of the PDE because it does not depend on X. So those terms are automatically zero. So we still look at 
u0, v0, which do not depend on x, uh, and such that f of u0, v0, and is equal to 0, and the same for j. OK? So we are exactly in the same situation as before. And please be aware that since they do not depend on x, they are really also an equilibrium for the, for the PDE. OK? So u0, v0 is still an equilibrium for the system of PDEs. And we, will, and we will also make the assumption that the equilibrium is stable for the ODE, which means that B has two eigenvalues with strictly negative real parts, which is exactly assumption two above. So we assume that u0, v0 is stable for the ODE. That is assumption two in the upper board, OK? Uh, and now let's look at a specific um, perturbation of this equilibrium, which I will write in the, in the following way. So if u is u0 plus epsilon, which is supposed to be small, times u1 cosine of uh, x, and v is equal to v0 plus epsilon v1 cosine x okay. plus, let's say, uh, something which is of order epsilon square. Um, let me write maybe uh, what is the boundary. The Neumann boundary condition means that dx u at time at point 0 is equal to this is equal to 0 and the same for v. And this is, of course, satisfied by uh, the cosine. It's the reason why we put the cosine here, OK? Um, so now let's look on this specific perturbation, what the, the system of PDE becomes, OK? So for uh, DTU, of course, this is equal to, to 0. Then you will get um, something like uh, so here, it, let's say it's a, it's a function of t. So you will get like dt u1 minus, so here now you take the second derivative of the cosine, you get minus cosine. So it will give you plus d1 u1 is equal to, and what you get here is exactly the, the matrix B, so let me write it in this way, dTU2 plus dTU2 is equal to B U1 U2 plus uh, something of order uh, epsilon, okay? So this just comes out of the fact that you have taken a cosine, and so it just exchanges the sign of the d1 and the d2, and the b is just the matrix which is coming out of the linearization of the ODE. Okay, so as you can see, this can be rewritten. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. It had to happen. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, 
sorry, this is still U1, so yeah, let's write it this way. So, um, so as you can see, this can be rewritten like dt of uv is equal to a plus b uv. And uh, by specializing the, the perturbation on the cosine, in fact, we have, in some sense, projected onto, uh, um, onto an eigenspace uh, of, the, of the Laplacian here. So in that case, it's very simple because it's just a Fourier series. Um, and we end up once again on a system of two ODEs once it is linearized. But this time, instead of having just a matrix B, we have the matrix A plus B. And A is exactly satisfying the condition one because it's exactly minus D1, zero, zero, minus D2, okay? So we also have one. So we have now one and two. And so what the Turing instability uh, theory says is that if now for B you have a structure like the one I, I, uh, I, I wrote down on the, on the board in terms of signs inside the matrix, it is possible to produce states which are stable which are stable equilibria for the ODE, which are not anymore stable equilibria for the PDE. So this means that you start from a situation where everything is homogeneous, everything does not depend on X, okay, and you let it evolve with diffusion, and what happens is that this is destabilized, and so it will evolve towards something which it's not possible to guess out of the linearized theory, which I have written down here, but will, which certainly will not be homogeneous anymore. So this is why you produce patterns, that is, things which are dependent on x in your, in your domain, out of diffusion plus reaction, okay? And from this picture, you can guess what is really important if you want to have this possibility of creating patterns. First, you have to have a structure of the equilibria in which you have, uh, let's say, uh, one of those matrices, and this is called in the biology literature uh, inhibitor uh, activator structure. And secondly, you have to have uh, diffusion terms, so the D1 and the D2, which are, in fact, very different one from another. So as you can see, D1 has to be very large and D2 very small, but if you, if you look at it more precisely, you see that basically what you need is that they are very different. That is, the, the, the diffusion of one of the species has to be much larger than the other one. And if, in fact, if you look very precisely at the proof, you can see that it has to do with the signs which are here. That is, it's not any one which has to be large and the other small, but it really depends on the signs that you have in the in the matrices. So this is really what you can keep in mind for those of you who are not familiar with the Turing instability, that this is something which produces patterns and which occur when you have an equilibrium in which you have various signs in the matrices plus diffusion rates which are very different one from another, okay? Now, let me maybe explain the, the, what was written in my last slide. That is that when you have a competition structure, you never have Turing instability. So the reason for that is the following. Uh, I don't know, maybe I will write on the, on the right here. I hope everybody can see if I write here. Yeah. Okay, so now let's look at the structure that you have when you have competition uh, lotka volterra equations. Okay. 
So, uh, so you have the uh, diffusion structure on the on, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, uh, you have something which looks like this. So this is R one minus S one one U minus S one two V times U and R2 minus S21U minus S22V times V. Sorry if I mixed the 1, 2, and 2, 1. Of course, it will not change anything in the rest. So now suppose that you have an equilibrium which is uh, a coexistence equilibrium in this, uh, in this equation. So if U0, V0 is a coexistence equilibrium. So this means that both u0 and v0 are strictly positive, and this means that u0, v0 are in fact satisfying that this is equal to 0 and this is equal to 0. Okay, we do not use the part which is here. Okay, so this is a solution of this and this. Of course, um, only uh, positive solutions are interesting for the biology because those are concentrations of individuals. Okay, so now let's, let's do uh, quickly the, uh, um, the perturbation theory around this equilibrium. So you write now uh, u is equal to uh, u0 plus epsilon u1 plus something of order uh, epsilon square, like this. And you look at what happened in, in, in those terms. So as you can see, you have R1 minus S11 times U0 plus epsilon U1 minus S12 V0 plus epsilon V1 times U0 plus epsilon U1. Okay, all of this plus terms of uh, secant order. And now the term of order zero here is disappearing because you have supposed that this is an equilibrium, so that this thing taken at point u0, v0 is equal to zero, okay? So this is in fact equal to minus S11, u1, minus S12, v1, times u0, and there is no term coming out of epsilon u1 because the term of order zero here is zero, okay? So this is this times epsilon plus a capital O of epsilon square. And as you can see, those are the two terms which will appear in the upper part of the, of the matrix. So the matrix will be, the matrix B will be with a plus plus here. And of course you can do exactly the same in the second one which is completely uh, uh, identical up to the change of names of the variables, and so you end up necessarily with a matrix B which has a, a plus or minus everywhere, sorry. With my notations, it's minus everywhere. So because of this, we, yes, Carla. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, sure, it's exactly equivalent. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the point is, with uh, Lotka, Volterra, with competition, you can never produce Turing instability. And this has been known for a very long time, um, because really the um, activator inhibitor uh, structure uh, has to be present somehow in the equations. And I mean, people who are familiar with this will immediately see that it will not work in, in, in this case. Okay, so um, let me remove all the blackboards.
So now the model that I will present um, is really dedicated to obtaining uh, a reasonable model in terms of uh, biological assumptions, uh, which has the, the, the capacity of producing patterns, so of producing some kind of Turing instability. And um, so the... Sorry. So what, that is the, the kind of thing we want to see. So here, uh, the yellow shoe, uh, and the red corresponds to places in which the concentration of the first or the second species is dominant. Okay? So we want to see things like this. And uh, so before I show this, uh, let me, sorry, yeah, it's here. Uh, let me uh, explain uh, the answer which was proposed uh, by the Japanese team of Shikesada, Kawasaki, and Teramoto in, uh, in the late 70s. So their idea was the following. Let's start again with the lotka voltra model um, plus diffusion. But let's now suppose that the, the individuals of the, of the two species, or at least the individuals of one of the two species, are intelligent enough to realize that they should avoid somehow the, um, the individuals of the other species, because they are in competition with them. So what is the way in which it's possible for them to act? Of course, if they can uh, sort of measure the gradients of individuals of the, of the other species, they could go in the opposite direction. But this asks really a lot of intelligence to be able to measure the gradient uh, of population. So what is more uh, reasonable is to assume that they, they are just able to measure the, the level of the, of the population of the other species in their surrounding. And to modify their diffusion rate according to what they see. So this is really what is uh, proposed here. The point is the following. In theory, species U diffuses with uh, a, a rate D1 and species V with a rate D2. And the extra terms which are, which are here correspond to the possibility of an individual of species uh, U, let's say, when he sees uh, individuals of the species V to increase the diffusion rate, which is here. So it increases the diffusion rate, that is A12 here is bigger than zero. Okay. And in principle, it could also increase its own diffusion when he sees individuals of the same species. So you can also have a term here. And of course, you can have the same for individuals of species V. So that at the end, you have a whole matrix here, which modifies the diffusion rate uh, of the two, of the two uh, uh, concentrations of the, uh, and uh, so for historical reasons, the terms A11 and A22 are called self-diffusions, and it's something which is quite common in many models of mechanics, including uh, porous media, and also one model which is called fast diffusion, which is also coming out of mechanics. But the terms A12 and A21, which are here, they are much less common uh, in, uh, in, uh, in modeling because they, you see that they mix the inside the, the, the diffusion term, they mix the two, uh, uh, the two concentrations, U and V. And for this reason, they are called uh, cross diffusion, which means that somehow they are in places where they should not be. So it's like, a, like if you have a cross in the, in, in, the, in the diffusion terms. Uh, they nevertheless appear in a certain number of models of, in physics, but they are rather uncommon, and maybe the most well-known is the so-called maxwell stefan model for um, rarefied gases, but I will not say anything about this. Uh, and a very important case is the case in which uh, one of the two cross-diffusion terms, so let's say this one, is equal to zero, which means that you typically have a situation in which, let's say, only one of the two species is intelligent enough to try to avoid the other ones. And this is a situation that can appear in many, in many instances, for example, when you have a parasite and a host and all things like that. Okay? So one of the two is trying to avoid the other ones, but it's not the same for the, for the other ones. Then one has to think a little about the science here, if it's really competition or something else which should, which should appear. But anyway, 
uh, the, uh, the fortune of this model uh, came from the fact that this model actually uh, produces Turing instability uh, because of this extra term here, even when it's triangular, that is, even if this, when this uh, uh, term here is equal to zero, the cross diffusion term here, uh, in fact, changes the computation that we have in the, in the Turing instability because the, the matrix A that you add because of the diffusion is not diagonal anymore, but has an extra term uh, here. And this actually modifies what you need in terms of signs in the, in the matrix. So I don't know if I will have the time to do that uh, tomorrow, but maybe we will spend five minutes just to show how Turing instability can really appear in this model. Uh, whereas we did not change anything in the reaction, okay? So the point is, instead of trying to uh, have something more complicated at the level of the competition term, let's change the, the diffusion and take into account a possible effect, which is something that you, that you expect for, uh, for a biological species, but that you would certainly not expect in, in things coming out of physics, that is that you have a kind of uh, modification of the behavior uh, depending on the situation in which the individuals are, okay? So I have uh, one more minute, so let me just, um, yeah, let me just finish by explaining uh, 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 very briefly this picture here. So this is a picture which was uh, obtained by, thanks to uh, uh, softwares which are computing bifurcations. And um, so those people here, they took um, the, the, the Shike Sada Kawasaki Teramoto model, which I uh, wrote in the previous slide. They considered the triangular case, and they let one of the parameters in the model move, typically one of the diffusion rates, so either D1 or D2. And uh, they observed the following diagram. So when uh, this parameter has a certain value, which you can see here, then what you can observe is just the homogeneous uh, 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 trivial equilibrium, if you wish, the one which has a form U0, V0, with U0 and V0, which do not depend on X. So here you do not have any patterns. And then when these parameters arrive at a certain level, uh, actually this is destabilized. So this is really the appearance of Turing instability. And instead you have two uh, curves uh, which appear, which corresponds to spatially homogeneous solutions exhibiting patterns. And uh, actually it's possible to keep on uh, moving the parameter and to see many other bifurcation appear in the diagram so that many more uh, complicated solutions appear for the problem, stationary solutions. And they were able to compute that for a certain value of the parameter, you have up to 11 different uh, steady solutions to the problem. So it's really a problem which becomes extremely complicated, extremely complex in terms of dynamics when uh, uh, certain parameters go to zero, typically the standard diffusion rates in the, in the equation. So you can really produce uh, an incredible complexity out of this SKT model in which the basic ingredients are uh, competition between the two uh, species, uh, standard diffusion plus one extra parameter, which is this cross diffusion terms, which takes into account the fact that the individual of one of the species can increase their diffusion rate if they are in presence of uh, individuals of the other species. And yes, this is done linearly with respect to the number of individuals in the in the other species. So this is really something which creates complexity, and because of this, uh, this model has acquired uh, uh, some popularity, and so this is a transition for, for the talk of, of tomorrow. Um, it became popular enough to attract the attention of many mathematicians who tried to show a certain number of properties of the model, and uh, uh, lately, so to get in, especially together with Ariane Trescazès in the case of the triangular system, but also with Ayman Moussa and Thomas Lepoutre in the general case, uh, we worked on, on this model in order to show that it is in some sense well behaved from the mathematical point of view. And this will be the story of, uh, of tomorrow. So today was really dedicated to 
explain why we consider this model, and then tomorrow we'll do the estimates uh, on, on, on this model. Okay, thanks a lot to you.